The following is a production of New Mexico State University. Now we're going to go to the economic side of things, and we're going to focus on an issue we've already talked a lot about today, which is health care. So Dr. Marin is going to join us to visit a little bit about his vision and what he sees as the complications and challenges and opportunities surrounding uh, the financing of our health care initiatives. A little bit more on his bio so you understand his perspective and his experiences and why uh, we wanted to have him join us today. He was a member of the President's Council on Economic Advisors. He served in the White House from 2002 all the way through 2009. And dog years, in human years, that's about 100 years of your lifetime when you spend that much time in the White House. He also served as acting D director of the Congressional Budget Office, which is the, the watchdog of the budget for the Congress. And he served as a direct, executive director of Congress's Joint Economic Committee. Dr. Marin knows this issue. He lives, eats, and breathes the numbers around this issue and other issues impacting government. And it's our honor to have him here today to discuss this challenging topic, which is taking so much mind share of our government right now. Dr. Marin, thank you. The podium is yours. Okay, thanks. All right, so I am constitutionally incapable of standing still. And so I'm trying out a lavalier mic. Is it working? Can you hear me? And is there, are there weird echoes if I walk by this microphone? No. OK, great. So hi, I'm Donald. Uh, it's an incredible pleasure to be here. Uh, other folks have said this, but I just want to reinforce it, that uh, if Pete Domenici invites you to come speak on something related to the budget, you come. Uh, back in Washington, Senator Domenici is a member of the you know, limited group of people who are budget royalty. Uh, and you know, has an enormous reputation as someone who tried to be fiscally responsible in a town that doesn't appreciate that, and as someone who uh, often reached across the aisle uh, in a town where that's becoming uh, less frequently common. Uh, and so it, it is a loss for the Senate that he's not there. Hopefully there are some folks who are picking up the baton. Uh, but he really contributed a lot in Washington. My background, as was just described, so I'm a card-carrying economist, uh, which is a good thing, not a bad thing, uh, for thinking about uh, health care. And I've chosen a career path where I've tried to do every job an economist can do. Uh, so I started off being a professor, then I went into consulting, then it got late in the bubble years, so I figured I had to go do a startup. Uh, so I went to Austin, Texas, and actually uh, helped found a startup in the health IT space, right, trying to figure out ways to bring IT to healthcare to make it work better. Uh, brilliant vision, but also got to experience, you know, the whole start a company, run out of money, lay everyone off kind of thing. Uh, which was an interesting experience. And I just, for the students in the room, at the time, during like the, the happy bubble days of, of the tech days, you know, they always said, you know, failure never hurts you, failure's always good, go take risks, it works out, no one holds it against you. It is completely true in my experience. So I went off, I did this thing, the thing frankly didn't work for a whole host of reasons, but A, I learned a lot about human beings, I learned a lot about healthcare and how healthcare works, and then I had a story that differentiated me in all my future job interviews, uh, particularly in Washington where frankly you have a lot of folks who do economics who'd never go out and actually try to do something in the, in, in the rest of the real world. But nonetheless, after that I also decided, hey, let me go hide out in government for a while where I'm a little less likely to get laid off. Uh, Although it turns out if you work in Congress, that isn't true since your bosses are always up for re-election every two years. So there's always risk anyway. Uh, so worked in Congress for a while, worked in the White House, went back and ran this thing called the Congressional Budget Office, which I think is a gem of an organization in our government. Uh, the CBO's job is to basically tell the truth to Congress, okay? which is, is a stunning, wonderful thing that's often not appreciated by the folks in Congress when they want to do things. And you say, hey, that's going to cost a lot of money, or hey, that doesn't work. Uh, but it's something that makes our budget process much, much more effective. Uh, and then after that, I went over and during the financial crisis, went back to the White House and spent my time trying to save us from that with moderate success. Uh, and now I'm a private citizen again. Uh, and I guess the first thing I can say is, is of all the jobs I've done, I actually found public service to be the most rewarding and the most fun. Uh, both because of the, just the implicit joy of trying to make the world a better place, uh, coupled with the fact that government creates all sorts of interesting questions. Uh, but the challenge in government is, I mean, unless you get to be the top guy, you're actually at some point not allowed to have your own opinion. Uh, and so it is now liberating, so I've now been a private citizen for about eight months, uh, and it is now liberating that I can now have my own opinion about things. And so what, what you will hear from me today is kind of my transition as I go from here are the numbers, here are the facts kind of guy to guy with my own opinions. And so there'll be a mix of those two. Uh, on healthcare, basically what I want to talk about is there are a whole bunch of challenges we face. 
there's some policy options that we could choose to use to address those challenges, and then there's where the state of debate is in Washington. I had to miss the morning session of this conference today because the debate changed so much in Washington in the last 24 hours that I had to go study up on it so that I would be telling you guys true things. Let me start first with the challenges. The challenges are three, right? Coverage, quality, and cost. Uh, Dave Walker mentioned all of these briefly. Uh, so the first is coverage. You know, in rough orders of magnitude in the United States, if you went around and asked people, uh, of the 300 million people in this country, 50 million of them would tell you that they don't have health insurance. Okay, so roughly one out of six people. The first thing I would say about that is that is just fundamentally embarrassing, right? When I worked back at the White House, I often represented the United States in meetings around the world, and inevitably the other countries would mock me, right, for coming for a country where there's one-sixth of our population that don't have insurance. Right. Other developed economies have found ways to get that down. You know, it's impossible to get it to zero. Zero should never be the goal, because there are a whole bunch of weird people in the world. I mean, no offense to them, but just it's a complicated world. But you can get it down to you know, 7%, 5%, 3%, uh, and we haven't done that. So thing one is that it's embarrassing. Okay. Thing two is the 50 million number that you often hear, they are like 17 asterisks that go along with that. Okay, this is my like numbers guy speaking truth to power thing. Okay. Turns out, for example, there are a whole bunch of people who qualify for Medicaid but don't know it and don't sign up. Okay? Those are people who I think we've more or less done a reasonable job of providing insurance to, not perfect because they should know they have it, but there's a program in place, there's just a disconnect kind of on the marketing side. Then, if, for those of you who watched the President's speech last week, the uh, President gave a very moving speech. At one point he talked about how there were 30 million uninsured people in the United States that he wanted to cover. And so there, there's an issue about, well, when you're worried about the uninsured, how do you think about immigrants? And how do you think about the unauthorized immigrants? And how do you think about kind of the green hard holders who aren't citizens yet? And so there's a raging political debate about Washington about what the goal is. And depending on your taste, you might be interested in the 50 million number, you might be interested in the 30 million number. When you adjust it for the people who might have health insurance but not know it, right, you get down to kind of, you know, numbers like 20. Okay, so lots of numbers you can play with, and depending on the tone and interest of the person who's presenting them, you'll hear different ones. But anyway, you slice it, there's a, a large chunk of people in the United States who go without coverage. Now, why does that matter? Right, and what I want to drive home is that there are two reasons that matters. Okay, the first is, it is an empirical fact that if you have health insurance, you are much more likely to go get treatment. And so health, health outcomes are better for people for, with, who have insurance than on average for people who don't. Okay, and that's an important reason why we want people to have health insurance. A second reason is, if you don't have health insurance, or if you have health insurance that has some flaws in it or can be taken away, there are situations in which when you get sick, you can end up going bankrupt. And if you think about it, the purpose of health insurance is to protect you against both those risks. Right? Its, its goal is to get you health care when you need it, and it's to protect, protect you from blowing up financially when something happens. Okay, and so the fact that many people don't have coverage or some of the coverage that's out there isn't uh, sufficiently catastrophic, uh, doesn't cover everything that happens to them, means that Americans are exposed to both those kinds of risks, health risks and financial risks. And that that in principle is something that we as a nation ought to try to address. Second challenge is quality. And again, this is something that Dave mentioned. It's a little bit embarrassing how poorly our medical system actually operates. This is the thing that got me excited in the health IT opportunity I did in the late 90s, where you know, we did this research and you discovered that like, if you think about what the best practice of medicine is, and then you think about the actual practice of medicine in the field, there is a gigantic gap. And that many natural things that ought to increase the quality of healthcare, and in some cases reduce the quality of the cost of healthcare, don't for whatever reason actually get done. Okay? And that there's a big opportunity to fill that, it's very hard to do, but at the moment we fall short. And so you, know, and you also just have these facts about our lifestyle coupled with our healthcare system where you know, life expectancy isn't very impressive in this country relative to other developed economies. Infant mortality is not impressive relative to other developed economies. Uh, and frankly, we're just not accomplishing what we ought to be able to do on the quality front. Third concern is cost. And for cost, you're always going to have to put on your, remember that there are going to be two pieces to the cost story. There's going to be the system as a whole. Right, the nation as a whole, how much do we as a people spend on health care? And then there's going to be this government question, which is how much does government, and in my case I'm mostly, mostly interested in the federal government, how much does the federal government spend on health care? And what are the policy levers you can use in both of those areas? Uh, as Dave said, you know, we currently spend about 17% of GDP on health care. 
right? That is, you know, the highest other country I could think of uh, that's a developed economy is probably around 11%, and there are others that are lower than that. So we spend much more without any parent significant gain uh, relative to other economies around the world. And then on the federal side, and this is what I always think about whenever I talk about kind of how you think about our government, you know, ask yourself what you think our federal government does. And our federal government basically has three lines of business. Okay? It has a health insurance business, which is the largest single piece. Right? Medicare, Medicaid, veterans, uh, employee health for, for people who work for the government. Uh, add it all up, it's an enormous amount of money. It's basically the largest single thing the federal government does. Its other two lines of business are pensions, Social Security plus employee pensions and veterans pensions, uh, and national defense. And then those among themselves take up about 70% of what the federal government does, and then everything else you think of as government is, is about 30%. And so then among those three big pieces, health is the biggest. And it's always important to keep in mind that the federal government touches the health system not just by spending money, which it spends lots, it spends more than $700 billion this year, so getting up close to a trillion, but then in addition there's a special tax treatment. And then in this country we have tax subsidies to encourage people to get health insurance. And the predominant one is that if you get your health insurance from an employer, you don't end up paying any taxes on that. No income tax, no payroll tax. And so health is treated very specially uh, related, or health insurance is treated very specially relative to other kinds of compensation uh, that you might get, in particular wages and salaries. When you add that up, that tax subsidy is about $250 billion a year. And so you add up the tax story and the spending story, and you're up around a trillion dollars a year that the federal government is either directly or indirectly uh, using to, to provide and encourage the provision of health care. As Dave was saying, you know, we're now in a world where the trillion just kind of rolls off the tongue when we talk about things in Washington, trillion here, trillion there. And so that's something that's going along at about a trillion a year. And there's a lot of interest in trying to bring that down. Okay, so three challenges, right? Coverage, quality, and cost. And as Dave suggested, you know, the other thing on the cost front is I just gave you where we are today, right? A trillion dollars a year, which is a lot of money. The long run trajectory is very scary in that the cost of health care per beneficiary, so per person in Medicare, per person in Medicaid, has traditionally grown faster than our economy grows, about two percentage points faster. And the result of that is that spending is rising much faster than the economy. The economy basically determines how much we can raise in tax revenues. And so as a result, health care spending is rising much more rapidly than our base of financing it. And so that's what gives rise to all this scary multi-trillion dollar numbers that Dave was using about how we have this enormous unfunded liability. And if things stay the way they're going, we're frankly going to blow up. Okay? And so we need, in Washington speak, to find a way to bend the curve. Right? There's this rapidly, exponentially growing curve of health care spending by the federal government. We need to find some way to bring it down. But first, the Washington debate at the moment is focused on expanding coverage. And you know, the first question you have to ask yourself there is, OK, what could I do to expand coverage in the United States? And there are a lot of different, uh, different levers that have been considered, different policies. Uh, the first obvious one, and this is one I'll return to, is to figure out ways to make health insurance less expensive. Right? Because people are economic actors. There are plenty of people in the marketplace who make incomes that are such a level where they have to make hard decisions about whether they want to get health insurance or not. And because health insurance is so expensive, many of them say no. And if you can find some way to make health insurance less expensive for folks, then more of them are going to voluntarily choose to adopt it without any need for any other government action. Okay, so that's one big benefit, right? Cost and coverage are related. Now that's not going to get you to the whole 50 million, 30 million, 20 million, whatever you want to think the number is. And so there's a lot of discussion in Washington at the moment about doing things like subsidies, either direct subsidies, we'll give you money when you get health insurance if you have, say, a low enough qualifying income, uh, or expand it through the tax code as a way to help people cover those costs. Okay, that's not something that reduces the overall system costs, obviously, but it's something that makes the cost lower for the person and therefore makes them more able to get coverage. A third strategy is to go into the insurance markets and say, aha, Part of the problem at the moment is that some people are unable to get reasonable health insurance. And the quintessential example is uh, the pre-existing condition folks. So for whatever reason, you have some chronic disease, it's expensive, insurers don't particularly want to cover you. If you find yourself out and unprotected in the individual marketplace trying to buy insurance, you will find that very difficult. Now, I personally do not blame the insurance companies for that. Because from an insurance point of view, once you have the pre-existing condition, right, like, you know, 
the uncertainty has been resolved, you are known as being an expensive person, and it's understandable that insurance companies wouldn't want to pick you up, right? particularly in a world where people are able to pick and choose, and particularly in a world where sometimes people go without insurance until the moment they become sick and then become more expensive. So what that is, I don't, I don't view that as a blame the insurance company thing so much as a flaw in our system, that we have a system where you can get a chronic disease and yet somehow end up without insurance so that you've become a high cost person who doesn't have coverage. And so a response to that first is to prevent insurance companies from screening based on pre-existing conditions, right? saying they have to take everybody in, and then coupling that with these ideas of an individual mandate. An individual mandate would say everyone you know, who can afford it, you know, maybe not 100%, but say 95% of Americans have to go get some health insurance. And if you do the combination of an individual mandate and forbidding insurance companies from screening based on pre-existing conditions, you end up in a situation where basically everyone's in the insurance market the whole time. And that if something bad happens to them, if they change jobs, if they need to go get new insurance, they can get it, uh, and they're still covered. And so a lot of the work in Washington at the moment has been trying to take those two ideas and figure out some politically palatable way to put them together uh, as a way to encourage more coverage. There's also been this discussion about possibly creating a public plan, right? saying, hey, there isn't enough competition in insurance markets. Maybe what we need is an additional plan that people can sign up for. I must admit and sign up and say that's something that I haven't yet been convinced makes sense, nor is it something that it appears the folks in Washington uh, on average have been convinced makes sense. There are lots of insurance companies. Uh, some of them come to dominate particular markets, uh, but you know, there's, there's, there's plenty of opportunities to get insurance in terms of places to go shop. Uh, and you know, given the success of Medicare thus far and keeping costs down and not running bankrupt, uh, it's hard to believe that an additional public player in this marketplace would be the magical solution. But that again, that is something that's out there in the playing field. Okay, so those are things on coverage. Uh, as Dave said, you know, an important thing to keep in mind is anything you do to expand coverage is going to increase cost. Right? It may very well be good policy. Right? You may very well want to end up in a situation where 95% of Americans are covered. But that's going to require more money in the system because insured people will spend more. And it's probably going to require more money from the federal government to cause it to happen. And so if you're worried about our long-run fiscal situation, expanding coverage is not helpful. Right? It may be morally the right thing to do. It may be good policy. But it is a step in the wrong direction uh, from the narrow point of view of the federal, federal budget. Let's see. Costs. So costs are hard. And I'm just going to give you my message on cost to begin with and then go through some examples. I view the cost issue as something where we don't yet know really how to bring costs under control in healthcare. We don't really know for sure how to bend the curve. We have a lot of ideas, and I think many of them are good ideas, but we don't yet know how successful they would be and how large the magnitudes are. And so I actually like to think of healthcare cost challenge as being an R&D problem. And it's an R&D problem in the sense that we ought to go out and try the things that we think are going to work and then discover which ones do and then do more of them. And the ones that don't work, get rid of them. And frankly, as, as our speaker two ago, as the general was saying, right, doing things in government, you know, it's hard to get rid of them once you start. But you have to kind of instill that notion that, yeah, let's try some experiments. Let's try different things. Let's see what works and build on those. Uh, and among the things that it seems like are likely to work, okay, thing one, I'm an economist. You might think economics is about dollars and cents or the stock market or whatnot, but actually all economics is about is about incentives. Right? Everything else is commentary. The key idea is that people respond to incentives. And so when an economist looks at our healthcare system, the thing they take from it is, wow, the incentives are really weird. Okay? And the incentives are weird in a couple of ways. One incentive we have is the way we pay doctors. Doctors are basically rewarded for doing stuff. Right? The more stuff you do, the more you get paid. And so as a result, there's a natural incentive, right? When you meet with the surgeon, surgeons tend to recommend surgery. Uh, and you know, not casting aspersions on folks here, but it's just a, you know, the incentives are aligned that more treatment gets rewarded more, and then at the margin, you therefore get more of it. It isn't, you know, there's a lot of evidence suggests that there's a lot of wasteful treatments in our system that are unneeded. And so one of the big R&D opportunities is to think about, can we come up with a different way to pay doctors? And instead of paying them per treatment, can we pay them per episode of care? Right? So you're someone with a particular disease. The doctor is going to get paid $5,000 for treating that disease. And then that's it. And so therefore, the doctor has more of an incentive to calibrate how much treatment they give you. 
You may recall that we did a version of this in the 1990s where HMOs came along and did capitated payments. Doctors would get so many thousands of dollars for recovering a particular, particular patient. That did help bend the curve in the 1990s. But frankly, it also gave rise to a great deal of frustration. Right? That was the period in our history which gave rise to the complaint that you, know, you only got to spend three minutes with your doctor. And so the R&D problem is to figure out, well, how do you redesign payment systems so you get rid of this perverse incentive for too much treatment, and yet calibrate it in such a way that people still feel like they're getting appropriate care from their doctor? And that's something there are experiments being done on that, but that's something that's very important. There are incentives on the consumer side. We have a system in which at the moment, through the tax code and various other incentives, people have an incentive to get kind of soup to nuts uh, Cadillac, Cadillac health insurance plans, which discourage them from being careful shoppers and careful users. Right? And so at the margin, when the doctor says, hey, why don't you get a third MRI this month, right? there's nothing coming out of the person's pocket or maybe two bucks coming out of their pocket. And as a result, they go along with it. Right? Whereas if they had 20 bucks on the line, they would be more likely to say, you know, I actually had an MRI three weeks ago. Why don't I just make the phone call and get those records over here? Okay, so there's R&D to be done on figuring out how to calibrate the consumer incentives. There, the trade-off is, yes, we want people to be good shoppers, but we don't want to undermine the whole point of insurance, right? Because the whole point of insurance is that you're not spending money out of your pocket. Okay, and so that's a hard trade-off, but there's a lot of evidence that says, suggests that if you calibrate it right, you can get some cost savings from the consumer side being better at things. Third approach, and this is one that gets an enormous amount of attention in Washington, and when I was running CBO was the single largest cause of Congress people calling up to yell at me, was that there are a lot of ideas out there, what I'm going to call silver bullets, of things you can do that hopefully could increase quality and reduce cost, which are very attractive in Washington because it's hard to spend money. I mean, despite, well, let's see, that's not exactly right. Uh, spending money isn't quite as hard as it used to be. But nonetheless, at the margin, people like to do things that are free or, or cost less or, or save money, even in Washington. And so there are these ideas for proposals like expanded use of health IT, right, business I used to be in, doing more work on prevention, doing more work on wellness, uh, doing more comparative effectiveness, where you actually look at different treatment options and you ask, which of these makes sense, which we do a stunningly little amount of. All of these things in the abstract make a lot of sense and are things that you could see improving the value you get out of the healthcare system. The challenge is it's actually incredibly difficult to find opportunities to do those things that save you money. And the reason why, well, several fold, right? The first is the system left to its own devices tends to do the easiest, most cost-effective stuff. So if it's really easy, it's already been done, right? The second is it turns out the healthcare system is a complicated place. And a healthcare thing that works over here in a tightly integrated hospital network may not work over here in a fragmented doctor's office. And so it's hard to find examples that are going to work for the system as a whole. You may have to do things piece by piece. Uh, and then the third is if you put on your federal government hat, it's often very challenging to save money, kind of going back to a point I made a moment ago, which is that it's often the case that at least part of the marketplace is doing what you want. Right? So take prevention. There are certain kinds of preventative uh, interventions that doctors can do that are roughly done by, say, 60% of doctors, or 60% of cases where they ought to be done. And you can make a good argument that in a perfect world, they would be done, say, 95% of the time. Right? There's always 5%, again, of kind of the hard cases, but they ought to be done much more. And so people think hard about how can you have the federal government step in and encourage those things to go from 60 to 95. And the challenges from a federal government money point of view is that almost all ways you try to do that are hard to target. And then as a result, if you're going to, say, provide a subsidy to do this miracle preventative treatment, you're going to end up having to write a check not only to the 35% new ones, but to the 60% who are already doing it, who are going to feel really miffed if they aren't able to access that money and also will be very creative in finding ways to access that money. And so from a federal government point of view, even if there are opportunities for the system to improve what it does, the fact that you often have to pay a larger universe in order to access that makes those things often difficult sells at the federal level. And so you do find some cases where these interventions can save money and can be useful from a budget point of view. But the reality is, on average, kind of the silver bullet interventions turn out to be things that look unlikely to bend the federal cost curve, at least in the near term. And again, worth looking at and things we ought to do. And here, I, this is a point I should have made earlier, but, but goes throughout these things. There's a tendency in budget debates to focus on saving the federal government money, where you spend the money over here and then you try to find ways to spend it. And there is a tendency to talk about health care in the United States and complain about how much we spend on it. And I would just argue as an economist, economists, while we not, may not appear humble in public, uh, we're actually very humble people. 
And our view is that the goal is to have a system set up where people can choose what it is they want to buy. And if it turns out that, you know, after you've got two Hummers in the driveway and you've got high-speed internet, that basically what you want to do is spend 40% of your income on healthcare, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, to an economist, that's fine. If that's being done in a system that encourages you to make value decisions in, about healthcare, right, and decide that, hey, the incremental healthcare you're getting is actually worthwhile. And so, and just again, same for preventative uh, investments. Right? There are plenty of preventative things that you could do in the system that don't save the federal government money that may still make sense because they improve health. And so again, occasionally, I'm an you know, economist, I'm guilty of this, sometimes get kind of in the narrow budget box. But the ultimate goal is kind of you know, maximizing the value we get out of the system. And sometimes that's going to mean spending more money. Obviously, the folks who think that we ought to expand coverage think that's the right thing to do, spend more money, get more coverage. Uh, but then just make sure that we're getting our money's worth. Right, and that's really the, the, the hard part. All righty. Ah, uh, yes, taxation. So I would be risk. So now I'm going to get up. If I had a soapbox, I would get up on my soapbox. Uh, most policy economists who look at our tax treatment of healthcare think it's ridiculous. And the reason it's ridiculous is that, first of all, as I said before, it encourages uh, employer-provided health insurance over other forms of compensation. And so at the margin, it turns out employers give more generous insurance and they cut back on wages and salaries. And actually, the rising cost of health insurance is one of the reasons the wages and salaries have grown so slowly over the last decade. It's the primary reason. Uh, that has a couple of bad effects. One bad effect is it tends to shield people from, from knowing how much their insurance costs. And I remember this back when I was CFO of this startup where you know, we were you know, competing in a very active labor market. And so we, even though we were a small company, we had to provide health insurance uh, to our workers. And you know, the, health, the, the employees had absolutely no clue how much their health insurance cost. It was just this little line item that said, yes, I got health insurance. But it didn't show up on their W-2. Right? There wasn't any piece of paper that had a dollar sign on it. And so there was just this notion that it kind of came magically from heaven. Whereas, in fact, from our point of view, we're going, oh my god, we just hired a new person, and it's going to be $10,000 a year for their health insurance, which was a lot of money back in 1999. And so one challenge is to make all of this more transparent, so people actually know what the benefits are worth, know what the health insurance is worth, and so that they can be more proactive in thinking about uh, how to address it. In principle, you could do that by some sort of regulation that says all W-2s must include this information. Those kinds of proposals have never gotten anywhere. Uh, but if you change the tax treatment and say made health insurance uh, benefits taxable, uh, that would be something that would automatically show up on the W-2 and become much more transparent. Another perverse effect of this is that because it's based on what your uh, tax bracket is, right, so the value of the subsidy depends on how much tax you're getting out of, basically. And it turns out that that depends on your marginal tax rate, and your marginal tax rate depends on how much income you earn. And so as a result, the subsidy that's implicit in our current system has this weird regressive feature that the subsidy is higher for high-income people than it is for low-income people, which just strikes me as strange. Right? You would think if we were trying to encourage health insurance, you might want to make it either flat or possibly progressive rather than regressive. So said before, the tax area is an area where there's a lot of money, about a quarter million, quarter million, ha, right, a quarter trillion dollars a year. Uh, in terms of the subsidy goes out. And that looks like a pool of money that, in principle, one could tap to A, help bend the curve by changing some of the incentives in the marketplace, and B, find money for some of the things that the federal government wants to undertake. I should note that on the cost front, right, the big debate in Washington at the moment are these various proposals to expand coverage, maybe bend the curve, uh, and then find some way to pay for that. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that there is one other strategy in the narrow health space, which is there's always the strategy of looking somewhere else for the money. Right? So saying, let's expand coverage, let's increase spending on, 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 on health care at the federal level. And instead of finding some way to pay that out of the health care space, let's reach out somewhere else. And so you've seen proposals, say, to tax high-income people or to change the way that, uh, that charitable deductions are written off to make that smaller. Uh, you've seen various proposals, beginning to see some proposals to cut spending in other areas. That's another lever that you can pull on. You know, my personal view is that, you know, the federal government has such a large reach and presence and footprint in healthcare at the moment that the logical way to try to pay for any coverage expansions we do is really to go ahead and see if we can find the money somewhere else in healthcare, right? Rather than reach somewhere else, 
Uh, because as Dave nicely emphasized in his talk, don't forget that all of this is happening in a backdrop of just a gigantic fiscal crisis we have even separate from health. Right? So we're running trillion dollar deficits every year, uh, largely as a result of the financial crisis uh, and some other structural budget issues. We have these long run issues that are driven by health, Medicare and Medicaid, but also by Social Security. Uh, we have all these other problems where we're going to need to address them with other sources of money. And it would be a tragedy, in my view, if in doing the expansion of health coverage, we use up some of the money that we actually ought to be setting aside for those other problems. Okay. So now, where is the debate in Washington at the moment? So the debate had been, until last week, that there were a couple of bills circulating that were designed to expand coverage. And the strategy in Washington to expand coverage is to expand Medicaid. Right, think about Medicaid as a program that provides health insurance to low-income people. And so one way to cover more people is basically to make it easier to become eligible for that, right? either at higher income levels or it turns out for single males it's often hard to, become, to get into the program, expand it to cover them. That's part of the way to expand coverage. And then there's also this idea of creating health insurance exchanges where people could come outside their employer relationship and be able to buy insurance. And if they were sufficiently low income, I would be able to get a subsidy from the government to do it. And then coupling that with some of the insurance reforms I talked about earlier, about pre-existing conditions and individual mandates, uh, so that there would be a vibrant marketplace. Okay, and that's the basic strategy for doing this. Uh, mandates are typically, I should note, coupled with some sort of penalty. Right? You can't just say, thou shalt all do something, because it turns out actually not everyone responds when you merely mandate it. Uh, and so instead, you've got to have some sort of uh, stick back there. And so there are various kinds of penalties uh, in the system that would hit individuals or, in some proposals, employers uh, to encourage them to provide coverage. Okay. And the question is how you pay for that. And in the bill that had been circulating previously that was developed in the House, the answer for paying it was primarily raising taxes on high income people and some substantial reductions uh, in, in Medicare. What changed in the intervening time, oh, and I should note, that previous bill, that House bill, had a fundamental problem from, from a budgeteer point of view, which is that it was incredibly expensive. And so it cost roughly, it would have increased spending over the first 10 years by about a trillion and a half dollars, which I should note, by the way, is a number no one in Washington will ever tell you. They have all these neato ways of making the number look smaller, but trust me, it was a trillion and a half dollars over the next 10 years. More in the future. Uh, and then they were going to pay for maybe about 1.3 trillion over the next 10 years, so it would add to the deficits by about 200 billion dollars, which is still a lot of money, despite all this talk about trillions. Uh, and then it would widen in the future. And so the basic problem with the House health bill, which was the focus of attention until recently, was that it didn't bend the curve and it actually made our fiscal crisis much worse as you got out into the future. Okay? Now the President, much to his credit, gave his speech last week in which he said something that just warms the hearts of all budget serious people, uh, which is he gave, he gave basically his dime principle. And his dime principle is that he will not sign a bill that adds to the deficit over the next 10 years or in the future period. Okay? And what we saw come out yesterday, and what I was scurrying around to understand over the last 24 hours, uh, is a proposal from the Senate side, uh, from Max Baucus, the chairman of the Finance Committee, which is a bill that actually, at least on paper, satisfies that goal. And so it's a bill that, according to the Congressional Budget Office scoring of it, would be basically budget neutral over the next 10 years, actually would narrow the deficit slightly, would narrow it in the subsequent years, uh, and you know, looks to be something that's finally budget serious. Now, the way they did that was they had to give up some of the goals of the previous bill. So the coverage expansion is smaller, okay, well, understandable under these constraints. And they also threw away some other extraneous things that cost a lot of money but didn't expand coverage. And I personally, I, have, I should plug my blog. So I have a blog, dmarin.com. Uh, so I have a blog post up this morning that explains kind of four reasons why I think the, the, the new bill is a significant step forward. So that's one reason. That's the primary reason. Is it takes the budget constraints we face much more seriously. Uh, it still has some challenges. There's this notion I've talked about, about how, for many economists, part of the optimal policy mix ought to be to change the tax treatment of health insurance and make at least some of it more taxable. That is a complete non-starter in Washington. And as, as someone who is like almost as apolitical as possible while living in Washington, and I often feel like an anthropologist among all the political types, um, it is fascinating to me to, watch, to, to, to see this issue where, you know, traditionally Republicans hate taxes and Democrats, I'm oversimplifying, right, Republicans hate taxes and Democrats like them, right, right. horrible oversimplification but like many such, true. Um, and this is an issue where it's completely the reverse. 
And so what you discover in Washington is a whole bunch of you know, the serious Republican policymakers go around saying things like, hey, we ought to do what the economists say and change the tax treatment of health insurance and raise people's taxes. And you have the Democrats going, whoa, 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 whoa. Right, because the president has this commitment that he's not going to raise taxes on people who earn less than $250,000 a year. So we'll, we'll call them the middle class. There's a whole debate about 250 in the middle class, but kind of in the vernacular, he doesn't want to raise taxes on the middle class, and that doing the tax thing that I recommended would have that effect. Okay. The response to that, and I still haven't, I don't know any of you have seen the movie Spinal Tap, but there's a great line in the movie Spinal Tap about there's a thin line between genius and stupid. And I have not yet figured out whether this proposal is genius or stupid, but instead of doing the tax thing I discussed, which is change the tax treatment of health insurance for people who receive it, uh, what they're considering in Washington is a tax on insurance companies. And so the tax on insurance companies would say, if you sell a policy that is above some level, so it's a Cadillac plan with the definition of Cadillac to be negotiated, uh, that you'll be hit with a 35% tax. And then one of the things I teach my economic students is, you know, insurance companies are, you know, don't ultimately pay taxes, right? They might write the check to the government, but they're going to sit there and think, hmm, who can I else can I get this to pay this? And the one they're going to get to pay it is going to be the consumer. And so this is a backdoor way to raise taxes on the people who get these Cadillac health plans, who include some people in the middle class. But in Washington, it doesn't count, I guess, uh, as such. And so, like I said, I haven't figured out if it's genius or stupid, because it has some of the attributes of the thing I recommend, but it's not, I mean, it's much less transparent, it's indirect, uh, and not quite as elegant. But, so that's out there. So that's another key portion of, of the proposal out there. Uh, as I read the newspapers, I haven't been in touch with anyone personally, as I read the newspapers, uh, at the moment, the challenge in the political landscape is it's hard to pass a bill uh, without it being bipartisan, or at least there's an aspiration to bipartisan. The constraint is always the Senate. That's the one civics lesson I learned when I went to Washington is the majority in the House of Representatives can do whatever it wants. So it's entertaining to watch, but at the end of the day, very straightforward. In the Senate, it's much harder to get things done. That's where the constraint is. Uh, and the political debate really at the moment is about whether they'll be able to get a Republican or two or three on board for a bill or not. And then there's some horrible, weird Senate procedure stuff about what happens if they can't get a Republican, which I won't torment you with. Um, so my takeaway on that is, so I'm happy that the Baucus bill is much better than the things that preceded it. It's much more budget serious, which is uh, the thing I want you guys to take away from it. So they're, they're taking the budget constraints serious, but it's still a very heavy lift, and it's still not obvious that it's pulling all the levers uh, in the right way from my point of view. And even if it goes forward, it's very unlikely that it's done anything significant to address our long-run fiscal crisis. Right? So all the stuff that Dave was scaring you with earlier, right? In the best case scenario, a health bill passed by, by the Congress this year and signed the president won't make that worse, is my guess. That's the best case scenario on that front. And that we're still going to have this gigantic list of things that we need to explore and try to do uh, if we're going to get our fiscal house in order. And with that, happy to take questions. Dr. Marin's about to jump off the stage if we don't get a question for him. So let's start with our, uh, our student panel. Please. Uh, we got to get a microphone over. My name is Rebecca, and I live in Roswell. I go to Eastern New Mexico University. And I'm involved in the local government there in Roswell. And we are having a huge issue with recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals, which I know is a thing across the United States. And uh, when you talk about putting a cap on compensation for doctors and things like that, do you think that'll have an even worse effect on the recruitment and retention of healthcare professionals because they will no longer want to go into the profession? Oh, well, so thank you, Rebecca. That is a great question. And let me recommend to you, I can't remember the name of the, the book because I now read almost all my books on a Kindle. And if you read a book on a Kindle, it like, doesn't remind you what the title is. And so it's written by T.R. Reed. Uh, so you can search for him. Of what? The Healing of America. The Healing of America. Uh, and what he did is he went around the world and he analyzed healthcare systems. Analyze is too strong, right? He went around with his broken shoulder and went to doctors to see what they would do and talk to experts. And the, when I was reading through it, the thing that I always thought was most interesting was the answer to exactly your question, which is there are a whole bunch of other countries in the world where they pay healthcare, uh, 
healthcare folks, including doctors, much, much less than we do here. And yet, nonetheless, they stay in the game. And part of the reason, like in this chapter about Japan, it seemed to me that part of the way they did that, and this is me transmuting what he said into kind of anthropologic slash economic ease, was that it seemed like one of the things they do is that they paid them less, but they revered them more. And so kind of like in some sectors of our economy, at least we used to do it with teachers, where you would accept a low-paying job, but then everyone went around and said, oh my god, you're, you know, you're a doctor, that's wonderful, and that that kept them in the game. Um, I don't know if that would work in America or not, right? Because you know, but you know, I mean, they're kind of, you know, the, the all high flyers on Wall Street have kind of moved down on the pecking order, so there may be some room to kind of move some folks up. Um, another thing that people analyze a lot is that if you take not healthcare professionals as a group, but you divvy them into pieces, uh, you often hear concerns that one aspect of our system is that we over rely on doctors and under rely on RNs um, and physician assistants and whatnot. And there are people who suggest that actually part of what you should do might be to ratchet down what you pay docs, but actually to ratchet up what you pay RNs uh, and PAs and whatnot, and give them more responsibility for, for delivering people's care. Because even if you give them some raises, frankly, there are a lot of things that they can handle without, going to a doc without people going to a doctor so you could actually save the system money. Uh, my name is Brian Whitehorse with uh, New Mexico Tech. And uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Walker had given his uh, suggestions regarding Social Security. I was just interested in what was your suggestions for, for that. For Social Security? That is correct, to correct. Uh, so I was always taken, there's something, there's a guy named Bob Posen, uh, who works at Fidelity Investments, who put forward a proposal, where his idea was that basically you could make the benefit structure of Social Security more progressive. Right? So for relatively lower income folks, you could keep their benefits approximately what they're scheduled to be. But for the higher income folks, you could ratchet that down somewhat over time and make it less generous. And that always struck me as a logical kind of one of the two or three things that you would do in Social Security to improve its finances. Uh, there is a discussion, there is a hard discussion about whether uh, increasing the retirement age makes sense. Uh, that, you could argue that well, in either way, but that can help, you know, small changes on that side can, can help uh, on its structure. Uh, and this is now getting a little geeky, but this is something that actually would make America a better place and partly improve Social Security's finances, uh, is that at the moment the system is structured in such a way that once you get to around 62, 63, 64, uh, the system really discourages you from working. And that's bad for us as a nation because we need to grow the economy so that we can afford all these troubles we face uh, rather than discouraging people from working. Uh, and it turns out to be at the margin bad for Social Security. And so there are ways that you can reduce the disincentives to work in the program that at a minimum would be beneficial for the rest of the, uh, rest of the, the, the finances of the government and in practice might also be beneficial for Social Security. My name is Jackie Edwards. Uh, we've heard a lot of talk about coverage, cost, and quality, and a lot of discussion about the coverage issue. But well, my understanding in the healthcare system is a lot of the cost happens in the last 90 days of life. So we are not talking about perhaps the most morally challenging issue, but probably the biggest issue facing healthcare costs. Do you have a view on that? Right, so yes, so I do, good question. I actually, I actually have a moving blog post about this, to plug my blog again. Uh, so my father-in-law died this summer, and this is my first point on end-of-life care, which is that, so he was in the ICU with pneumonia, and you know, it's one of these things, right? You end up dying of a thousand different things, and you, you, people choose whichever one it is. For the first eight days he was in the ICU, everyone was under the impression that all the efforts that were being made were actually to save his life, so that he would then have X more years to live. And it was only like the last two days of the 10 that everyone knew it was end of life care. And so the incredibly expensive 10 days in the ICU goes in the record books as end of life care. But, but I think that overstates the problem because some of it, there was a chance it wasn't gonna be end of life care. 
and I think was actually cost effective and made sense. It was only really in the last couple of days that it began to be kind of, you know, yes, he's going to die. It's just a matter of whether it's today or tomorrow. So that's my first point. So I, so I sometimes worry that this, this concern is raised a little bit too much because it has the benefit of hindsight. Okay? But, you're, but the underlying point is still true, which is the, the, the general motive of medicine as we teach in this country is you know, to throw everything you have at it uh, and to try to save folks. And then the hard question is, well, if you think we're going to ratchet back on that, who's going to make those decisions? And, uh, you know, I mean, kind of the running joke at the moment is, you know, would you rather have a government bureaucrat make that decision or an insurance company bureaucrat make that decision? And when you frame it that way, people don't find that a very, like, you know, is there a door number three, right? Uh, now, the rebuttal, I, I, have to be, I have to do the free market guy for a moment thing, right? So the rebuttal to that is the beauty of private insurance is you get to choose your bureaucrat. Right, so you know, you get to choose the best of three private bureaucrats, in your view, to make this decision for you. But at the end of the day, right, so it's very hard, um, and you you know, you see these things that spin politically out of control, right? Which is if you have a little line in a bill that says roughly something like, "Hey, end of life stuff is really hard. Maybe someone should get a little counseling, not to like pull the plug, but like just to deal with how hard it is." Uh, you can get these firestorms of trivia. Right. Another thing I learned as anthropologist in Washington is you can have these gigantic issues that get overtaken by trivia, and that was, that was briefly one of them. This is my long like, filibuster not actually answering your question, <laughs> right? because I don't, that is a very hard question. They want to hear you. Your people want to hear you. Oh, no, they got to put it on the machine. <laughs> In the Bacchus bill, do they use uh, any assumptions uh, about uh, Medicare savings being applied to the cost of the coverage or not? Yes. Yes, so they do have changes to Medicare, and they have, they have the same problem that, as you know, the sustainable growth rate mechanism has, which is one way Washington often pays for things. My analogy here now is wimpy. Uh, you guys may be... Some of you are old enough to remember who Wimpy is, right? So the guy who gets, well, you know, I will gladly pay you for a hamburger Tuesday if you give me a hamburger today, something like that. Uh, Washington does a lot of budgeting like that in the health space where they say, God, this year we really want to pay doctors more, but the way we're going to pay for it is we're going to cut how much doctors are paid in 2012. Okay? And we've been doing that for a decade, and it's about to blow up. And unfortunately, in the Bacchus bill, there's some things that one could portray as having a similar structure to that where that to get the beneficial deficit numbers that are officially scored, you're assuming that Congress is really capable of doing really stringent cuts in payment rates in later years. And that may be a heavy lift in practice. The reason, that, the reason I asked is that you seem to, you seem to say in your, in your remarks that you didn't like that approach of moving money around like that to pay for it. Oh, you know, no, my, my, I think, well, the concern I had before was going outside the health system and kind of bring it in, because I think, I think to the extent we can, we ought to try to save it inside. But um, I, I want to say to everybody here, well, but, uh, yes, go ahead. let me say to you, yes. um, we've known about uh, these uh, funds being available from Medicare for a long time, and we haven't had the courage to, to go do that, and we've had a deficit all the time, which we could have used that money to apply mm -hmm. to. So what makes it, why do we think the seniors are going to let the politicians get by with it this time? Right, so A, right, so there's a question about whether it's politically viable, yeah, right, and then, then, then B, right, the other question you raise is, you know, go back to the issue I had, which is, there are things we could do to address our overall fiscal crisis, and it isn't advancing the ball if we use them to expand coverage. Well, maybe expanding the coverage ball, but it's not, it's not advancing the ball in terms of saving our fiscal situation. Right? And so it's entirely possible, building on your point, that you end up with a bill in Washington that looks like it's paid for, but it's paid for by doing kind of the obvious things we should have been doing anyway, uh, but never had the political will to. And now, in essence, we may find the political will to use them to expand coverage, but that's just going to make it even harder to address all the gigantic fiscal crises we face, or fiscal problems. Or, right, or, or we'll flinch. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot. So now we want to give you this as a token of our appreciation. Oh, thank you. Um, the tape came off of the description. I don't want you to lose that here. So I'm going to just fold it up.
again. Thank you so much, Dr. Great. Thanks Thank a lot. You. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Mayor. <clears throat> Just as a side, I see several colleagues here who are economists, and I think they've broken the code on how we pay at New Mexico State University. Uh, they pay you less but revere you more. So that, when, when you come around and ask the dean for some more money, I revere you muchly. Uh, <clears throat> you know, I want to thank the students in particular. They Excellent questions. Students, you were very bright and engaging. <clears throat> and then, of course, I want to thank all the speakers. All of New Mexico should have heard this conference in the last day and a half. All of New Mexico would have benefited dramatically with this. These are fantastic speakers bringing the message that we need to hear. And it was so timely, particularly this afternoon's session dealing with the national debt and health care, uh, Senator Brown's comments on health care. So timely, uh, delightful to see the general and, 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 and understand how they're strategizing in the military and to, to settle the border issues and nuclear energy and, and get some input on that. I just wish all of New Mexico could have taken advantage of this conference. We need to, we need, uh, it's being filmed and yes, uh, Nolan is saying it, it will be available on DVDs, right, Nolan? It'll be available on the web. But then I want to thank Senator Domenici because without Senator Domenici, we wouldn't have had these people here. <clears throat> One of, the beauties, one of the beauties of being the director of the institute is we can count on Senator Domenici using a, a little, little arm twisting to make sure that friends of his over his 36 years of service are available to come out and, and see us. And so we're blessed to have at New Mexico State University our good friend Senator Pete Domenici as one of our colleagues, as, uh, as the mentor for many of us, as the namesake for our great institute that we're developing here in public policy. Now, you can come this evening, and we're going to have a little different kind of program. We're going to have former Congresswoman Heather Wilson and Senator Domenici sitting up here, and they're going to have one of those fireside chats. And I'll probably ask them a couple of questions and then try to get out of their way. But I want to see a couple of people recently adjourned from the Senate and the House. And um, I can't say this about Congresswoman Wilson, because I don't know her aspirations, but I don't think Senator Domenici is going to run again. And I can guarantee my wife's here, I'm not going to run again. So we're not necessarily seeking the vote. And as a consequence, it's an opportunity to kind of kick back, be candid about the future of our country, the future of our state, uh, how are we going to get in and out of the, uh, some of the situations we're in. So I'm going to invite you all back at 6 o'clock. We'll have some, some uh, wine and cheese and snacks over here, and then we'll sit here and just have a comfortable conversation with two great Americans who've served our country so well. So with that, we'll sign up. Well, one more thing, one more thing. There's food next door, and I, I think they want that particularly for the students, because students can find food all the time. They know where food is. But the rest of you might not know that there's food right next door, and we would encourage you to go by, have a snack, and mingle just a little bit. We will see you here 6 o'clock this evening. Thank you very much for attending. The preceding was a production of New Mexico State University. The views and opinions in this program are those of the author and do not necessarily represent the views and opinions of the NMSU Board of Regents.